Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so we're going to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the ocean. So, and I just want to take a second to um, thank my advisor and collaborator, Victoria Coles, um, and thank Blue Waters um, for the opportunity with this uh, grad fellowship. So uh, the first order of business is what the heck is sargassum and why should I care about it? Um, so sargassum is a type of macroalgae or seaweed um, and it's unique in the ocean because there's only these two species that are found in the Atlantic that spend their whole life cycle floating on the ocean surface. Normally seaweed macroalgae needs to be rooted to the bottom in some way or attached to the bottom. Um, and it's um, it's important in a lot of different aspects of ocean chemistry and ecology. So um, it hosts lots of different organisms, both microscopic plants and animals um, that can be involved in nutrient cycling. Um, sargassum is actually very carbon rich. And so as it grows and dies and sinks out of the ocean surface, it may be locally important in sequestering carbon from the atmosphere to the deep ocean. Um, and then it's habitat and forage grounds for a wide range of different fish species and things like um, endangered juvenile sea turtles spend a, a portion of their life associated with sargassum um, and commercial fish like tuna like to hang out around these sargassum mats because there's lots of forage fish for them there. Um, and sargassum, and part of the motivation of this work is that sargassum can be good and bad when it washes up on the beach. So um, there's been a lot more um, beaching events of sargassum in recent years. And in small amounts, when sargassum washes up on a beach, it actually helps stabilize dunes and provides nutrients for dune grasses. But in the large amounts that have been washing up recently, um, you end up with this huge mess. And so it's, it's negative for tourism. It costs millions of dollars in beach cleanup. And so trying to figure out what's causing these blooms and these changes in sargassum's distribution um, is really key to this work. And so one of the things that really drew me to sargassum as a study organism is that it's floating freely on the ocean's surface. And so its habitat is a large portion of the Atlantic Ocean. And that habitat is defined by the ocean currents. Um, and importantly, it's not just experiencing those mean currents. It's actually experiencing all of this smaller scale variability as well. Um, and so it's just kind of important to keep that in mind. And, and part of, of the computational aspects of this work um, is trying to capture how these kinds of features are interacting um, and changing the growth and the distribution of this organism. And so how am I trying to simulate this you know, unique organism and its really complicated habitat. And so I'm doing that through a system of four couple models. And I'm going to step through each of them. Um, but just to introduce them, there's a, a physical model, a biogeochemical model, a Lagrangian particle model, and then a sargassum individual-based physiology model. So the most computationally expensive piece of this is the ocean circulation model. So I'm using a model called HICOM, um, or the hybrid coordinate ocean model. And I'm running this at a 1 12th degree resolution. So it's a little less than 10 kilometers. And this is actually modeling the full ocean circulation. So there's 28 vertical layers from top to bottom in the ocean. And the hybrid part of this is that it lets me focus um, more densely my layers at the surface, where I'm interested in sargassum and the nutrients, um, and more coarsely along density surfaces in the deeper layers. Um, so in this map, each of those tiny little grids is actually 10 by 10 model grids. So uh, there's a total in the horizontal of a little less than 2 million grid cells. And then when you add in those vertical layers, you've got about um, over 50 million grid cells that I'm calculating. Um, and so this, this model is giving me the temperature of the water, the salinity, the density, and the velocity. So the next piece of this is my biogeochemical model. And so I, I, I've developed this. I've adapted it from the work of Katja Fennel and some others. Um, and this is actually capturing both the base of the food web and the nutrients. And so uh, to put it in a little bit more um, useful context, really the important piece of this is that it's giving me information about phosphate, 
um, ammonium and nitrate. So these are the nutrients that Sargasso needs to grow. So the third piece here is Lagrangian particle model. So a lot of the work that I've done for this project has been um, adapting the baseline particle model that is packaged with HICOM um, and to make it really much more realistic for simulating sargassum. Um, so this model um, takes the velocities from HICOM and moves the particles around. And I've added a positive buoyancy, so I'm simulating this floating sargassum. Um, I've altered the code so that I can run these particles both forward and backwards in time so that I can actually see where particles are going or I can get a sense of where particles in a particular region may have originated. Um, and, and one of the imp uh, really important things that I've done here, so I've adapted it so that it'll sample both from the, the physical model and get things like the temperature and the salinity, but also sample um, the nutrient chemistry from the biogeochemical model. And finally, um, I've adapted the particle model so that it can run in what we call online and offline modes. And what I mean by that is that I can run it at runtime with HICOM, but I can also take at least daily output from HICOM and run this particle model after the fact. And it really makes this um, project much more flexible because I can run the computationally expensive piece once, um, and then I can do lots of different particle experiments afterwards. So the final piece of this puzzle is the sargassum physiology model. And so a you know, typical particle initialization is around 50,000 um, to 100,000 particles, and in each one of those particles, I'm running this physiology model. So it's taking the light, the temperature, and the nutrients, um, and calculating sargassum growth and mortality. And one of the really useful things about having it from this Lagrangian perspective um, is that it also lets us track the particle age. And so as sargassum floats out in the open ocean, it gets colonized by all these other organisms that impacts its ability to stay buoyant, it impacts its ability um, to receive light. And so by having that history of the, of the, of the of sargassum particles, um, you have a, a better way to track that aspect of its senescence, basically. Um, so just a couple of words on why blue waters. Um, these are just some of the sort of statistics of um, you know, the details of some of my runs um, and just uh, some example salinity and, and chlorophyll maps. Um, but really, the important thing here is that I'm looking at an, you know, an individual colony of, of one organism and looking at that, that scale of it taking up nutrients, um, but I'm also looking at mesoscale features like eddies that are maybe tens of kilometers and how those interact um, with the ocean physics and chemistry to change the conditions around this organism. And then I'm, what I'm really trying to do is to map the distribution of it over the whole Atlantic Basin. And so by having this resource like Blue Waters, I can do all of these things with this series of coupled models. Um, so I've done a lot of work um, over the past year of validating with satellite observations, um, both the biogeochemical model and the sargassum model. Um, and the, the takeaway here really is that like a lot of models, um, we're a little bit lower in variability than what the observations are from year to year, um, but we're doing a really good job of capturing um, that mean either chlorophyll for the biogeochemical model or the sargassum biomass. Um, and for the sargassum, we're doing a, a good job um, over most of the year of capturing the seasonality. And so this is an example of what this looks like when we put everything together. Um, so these are individual particles that are initialized every day, released into the basin, and then they're allowed to grow with sargassum. Um, and you can see at different times of year, the sort of center of mass of where the distribution is will change. Um, but there's actually a little dirty little secret here um, that I'm gonna get into. So um, one of the big questions that I have is how the sargassum population is sustained 
when we know that the circulation of the Atlantic in general tends to aggregate floating things in the central gyre. So the left four panels are the seasonal distribution of sargassum, and you can see how it changes over the course of the year. The right is actually the distribution of plastic, so inert floating particles. Um, and we can do that really good job of capturing the sargassum distribution that I just showed in that animation, but only when we're seeding new particles pretty continuously. And so what happens over time is that all of those particles will end up in the central gyre just like inert plastic would. And so this raises the question of, is there a seed region of sargassum? Is there some other biological mechanism that we're missing that we're not capturing in this model? So you know, why aren't we able to re, uh, reproduce this seasonal pattern without constantly reseeding everywhere? So one of the biological um, explanations that may help with this um, is that vegetative propagation may help maintain this distribution. So sargassum, pelagic sargassum, um, the only known method of reproduction is vegetative propagation. So as, um, as it ages, as it experiences stress, um, small pieces of it can break off. And if the conditions are good, any small piece can regrow into an entire new colony. And so I've added this into the model. Um, and this is sort of, um, I just want to take a second and say sometimes it's OK to present negative results, um, because they still tell us something interesting. And not um, everyone is always comfortable with doing that. But um, you know, we tried adding this vegetative propagation. and didn't actually make much difference. Um, and in fact, um, when we add vegetative propagation and don't constantly reseed, we we still see the particles, the sargassum, aggregating in the central gyre and then eventually dying off. And so just this one process by itself isn't enough to really um, improve our understanding of what's going on here. Um, but the other thing that we were able to do, um, because we have this large scale model, um, so that in, in previous work that I presented last year, um, I did a lot of connectivity analysis that suggested that maybe some different regions of the domain were more important than others in maintaining the seasonal pattern. And what I, I've been able to do over the last year is actually run particle experiments, a whole series of them, um, looking at what happens when we only seed sargassum in various regions of the domain. And it turns out that there's two key regions that when taken together, will actually do a much better job of replicating the seasonal pattern than any other individual region or than seeding everywhere. Um, and that, in fact, when we seed in the Gulf of Mexico and the Western Tropical Atlantic um, along the equator, um, we actually capture that seasonal pattern much better. Um, and that, uh, in addition to capturing that pattern better, when we have vegetative propagation, we actually get the biomass right too. Um, and so this is just an example of what that looks like. Um, and, and so when with and without vegetative propagation, so that's where the, the, the combination of the physics and the biology come together. So the physics is telling us that these two locations are really important. Um, and the biology is, is also saying that you need these regions, but without the correct mode of reproduction, you still can't fully replicate the, f the real or observed uh, distribution. Um, and so in this model paradigm, functions much better over the entire seasonal cycle. So now that we really have figured out these important regions for sargassum um, and its seasonal pattern, now I really want to dig into this question of how the physics and the biology interact in these regions, and specifically to start with in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so this is a map of sea surface height. Um, and we use this as a proxy for uh, things like eddies, Lagrangian structures. Um, and so, um, so uh, for instance, so we have a large eddy here in the central Gulf of Mexico. Um, you can see this is the signature of the loop current that comes in from the Caribbean and out through the Straits of Florida. Um, and you'll see here there's a, the hint of another eddy um, 
here in, in the Southwest. And so what I've, I've done here in the Gulf of Mexico over the course of a month um, is to plot both the sea surface height so we can see where those uh, eddies and fronts are occurring and the potential for sargassum growth. So this is the percent of the sargassum's maximum growth rate that it could conceivably attain given the light temperature and nutrient conditions in the Gulf at that time. Um, and what you can see, so there's some frontal regions where there's a high potential for growth. Um, and you can see that around the edges of this eddy, there's a higher potential for growth. And now I want to know how that interacts with the sargassum itself. Um, because just because the potential is there, it doesn't mean that the sargassum mats are actually aggregating in regions that would be favorable for them. And so I released um, a series of particles just evenly gridded and, um, and let them progress over the course of the month. And what you can see, there's, so there's a couple of important things that are happening here. So um, for one thing, you can see that these eddies, um, they can change the, the concentration or the potential for growth um, in different ways. So, um, and some of them are in training nutrients from the surrounding waters. Um, some of them are actually upwelling nutrients from the deep ocean. And so that's part of the motivation for really modeling the full 3D structure of the ocean is that we're not just capturing surface phenomena, but that actually these physical processes are bringing up nutrients from the deep ocean that are potentially changing um, the growth of this organism. And the other really interesting thing here is that, you know, the, the sargassum particles don't necessarily stay in the regions where their potential for growth is the highest. In fact, they tend to line up along the boundaries. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really interested in moving forward is actually adding inertia to these particles. So right now, um, they're freely moving. And we know from some other observational studies that um, sargassum will obviously behave like an inertial particle, and that can really change whether it's retained within an eddy or not. Um, so that's one of the, the things I'd like to focus on going forward. So I mean, really, the, the take home from here is that you know, sargassum is, is experiencing a really dynamic environment that is being changed not just by the, its biology, but by the ocean physics around it. So um, just to sum up, uh, I've shown that the Gulf of Mexico and the Western Tropical Atlantic are really key to sustaining the sargassum distribution. And we really wouldn't have been able to figure that out if we hadn't had this basin scale model to be able to run experiments with. Um, and that we also found that the vegetative propagation of this organism was important. Um, and so you really do have to think about this in terms of both the ocean physics and the biology. Um, and then finally, the eddies and fronts um, in regions like the Gulf of Mexico can alter the growth conditions, um, but the experience of any individual sargassum colony is going to be much more variable than what just a mean field might tell you. Um, and with that, uh, I just I want to thank uh, the Blue Waters team again, the um, NCSA folks, my point of contact, Tom Cortese, has been pretty instrumental in making all of this happen on Blue Waters. So, thank you. Thank you.